Hi, I'm Kalila Reynolds and welcome to Taking Stock. We're bringing you all the latest business news and telling you how it will affect you and your money. But before we get started, head over to my website, kalilareynolds.com to subscribe to our newsletter. You can click the link up here or in the description box below. Now, come on, let's get this money. First up, in a year of the COVID-19 pandemic, real estate and investment company First Rock Capital Holdings is reporting a 300% increase in net profits of nearly 3.7 million US dollars for the past 12 months. We'll speak to First Rock's co-founder Ryan Reed about these impressive results and their aggressive expansion. And later, the analysts swain on the latest market developments. Sibony Group's sudden jump in share price has raised eyebrows. What's behind it? And Mailpack's results are out. We'll discuss. But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. The Planning Institute of Jamaica, PIOJ, has projected that the economy fell 9.4% between October and December 2020. If confirmed by statin, the outturn would mean the economy dropped just over 10% for the full 2020 calendar year. PIOJ Director General Dr. Wayne Henry says the latest projection continues to reflect the negative effects of the pandemic on the economy. Goods producing industries are estimated to have contracted by just under 1% and the services industries by 11%. The PIOJ says with the pandemic still at hand, the economy could again contract up to 9% between January and March this year. Meanwhile, the Caribbean Development Bank, CDB, is projecting that the region will record growth of 3.8% this year. The projection was outlined in Part 1 of the CDB's Regional Report, 2020 Review and 2021 Outlook, released last week. However, it said the ongoing nature of the crisis threatens its outlook. The CDB says its projection comes after an extremely difficult year in which the economies of its 19 borrowing member countries contracted by almost 13% on average due to the pandemic. It said Guyana was the only economy to record economic growth at 26% solely due to the startup of its first oil production. However, growth was lower than expected due to lower global oil prices. Barita Investments Limited has acquired a 20% stake in Derman Trading Company. The transaction took place during Derman's additional public offer APO, for which Barita was the lead broker. The APO was oversubscribed. The minority stake acquisition sees Derman becoming an associate company of Barita Investments. Director of Barita Investments Jason Chambers says Barita's leadership teams are satisfied with the investment, noting that it aligns with their mission of seeking opportunities that provide solid risk-adjusted returns to shareholders. The Jamaica Public Service, JPS, will be closing seven of its offices this month. JPS said the activity will start on March 8 and be completed on April 1. Only the Bill Express sections and the courtesy phones to call the JPS call center will remain. The closures follow a similar activity last year with offices in Trelawney, Portland and Hanover. The remaining JPS customer service offices will be Ruth Ben Road in Kingston and St. Andrew, Spanish Town, Mandeville, St. Anne's Bay and Montego Bay. In the meantime, JPS says it will be accelerating its digital customer service system as more customers choose to do transactions online. Streaming company Spotify has finally entered the Caribbean as the company expands across 80 countries. The announcement was recently made at the company's Stream On event. Spotify is being rolled out in at least 14 Caribbean nations with users in Jamaica already enjoying the platform. Spotify is free with an option to upgrade with a paid version. It's also a one-stop app for music, podcasts, and playlists. According to Business Insider, Spotify pays less than one cent US per stream. To make a dollar US, it would take about 250 streams. This relationship means an artist can make music and send it out to the world via the platform without paying manufacturing or distribution costs. Meanwhile, Spotify said they will work with local creators and partners in each new market to expand their music offerings and deliver an experience that meets the unique needs of each market. Over time, the company aims to introduce its full music and podcast catalogs, free and premium plans, as well as new platforms such as wearables, TV speakers, and car app. Twitter has revealed a paid subscription service it's been working on for some time called Superfollow. 
It will allow users to get exclusive content, deals, and community access to creators for $4.99 US per month. The new feature is part of an economic model to diversify the company's revenue and was announced at its annual investor meeting. Superfollow is set to compete with existing services like Patreon and OnlyFans. Subscriptions also come with the option to cancel anytime. Twitter currently makes money from ads and promoted posts. What's Hot was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. When we come back, First Rock Capital Holdings has had a stellar year, even during a pandemic. We'll sit down with First Rock boss Ryan Reed. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency, insurance made easy, and Massey United Insurance. How good is your insurance? Welcome back to Taking Stock. We've been watching the real estate space keenly on this show, and one of the listed companies heavily involved in real estate is First Rock Capital Holdings. They posted record profits and expanded their footprint, both indications that the sector is not slowing down despite the pandemic. Joining us now is co-founder of First Rock, Ryan Reed. Hi, Ryan. Welcome back to the show. Hi, Kalila. Good to be here. Your second time on Taking Stock, and you've been meeting yep. I feel like I hear your name all the time now. Well, I hope that's good things. <laughs> good things, yeah. One of the executives to watch, I tell you. Oh, boy. <laughs> the <laughs> and pressure. You're dad, and you're a new dad, so there's yes. even more pressure. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let's talk business. We can leave Riley for another time for, for yep, other yep. discussions. Yes, um, yes, yes. Tell me about the past year, because a lot has happened in the past year since we last spoke. When you came on the show, you were doing the IPO, so you were just uh, putting yourself out there, putting the company out yeah, there, a yeah. successful IPO, and now you've had a successful 12 months to report. Yes. So tell us about that. You know, when we when we spoke the last time, Kalila, you know, we spoke about our pipeline, right? And we had a bunch of transactions that we were actively you know, pursuing. And, uh, you know, once we completed the fundraise with the IPO, we immediately executed on some of those transactions. And what we're seeing today is really the manifestation of, of those efforts, which, you know, produced what we would call comfortable or commendable um, financial results for the year 2020. So what are some of the projects that you've pursued in the past 12 months? So prior to the IPO, we had roughly about 12 properties in four jurisdictions. We now have 21 properties in, in those same jurisdictions. Those, those jurisdictions are Jamaica, the Cayman Islands, Costa Rica, and the United States. And we've expanded our footprint in every single jurisdiction um, in line with our asset allocation mandate. And you've just made some additional acquisitions in the Cayman Islands. Yes. And just for the benefit of your of your viewers, our main segments are residential and commercial real estate. And we have residential in Cayman Islands. We have both commercial and residential in Costa Rica. And we have residential in the United States. And obviously, we have both, uh, a mix of both in, in Jamaica. Our allocation sees us having roughly about 67 or there about percent of our assets in Jamaica and the rest spread across the other three jurisdictions. As at December 31st, we have roughly five and a half billion Jamaican dollars or the equivalent Jamaican dollars in assets, in total assets, which is in effect roughly half a billion dollars beyond what we, we targeted for the year 2020. Yeah, so tell me, the new acquisition in the Cayman Islands, though, that's residential yes. or commercial? Residential. Only residential in the Cayman Islands. Okay. You know, it's, it's interesting what the past year has shown us because a lot of people have been expecting real estate prices or had been. I don't know if the expectation is still there given yes, what's yes. happening. But a lot of yes. people had been expecting real estate prices to fall given the pandemic, which is typical during a recession. But we haven't mm -hmm. seen that. Why do you think that is? You're heavily invested in this space. This is yes. what I'm looking for first rock. What's what's up with the real estate sector? I mean, if you date back to even 2007, 2008 in, in, in Jamaica and other developing economies, what you find is that investors 
in times of uncertainty, we usually retreat to safe assets or stable assets. And it doesn't get more stable than, than real estate um, among all, amongst all asset classes. And so what we've seen is, you know, with the, 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 the onslaught of, of COVID-19, you know, persons have been feeling quite comfortable in investing in real estate. Uh, what we're seeing in Jamaica, in the Cayman Islands, in Costa Rica, the demand for real estate, you know, residential, commercial, has been quite encouraging. Um, and, you know, especially in Jamaica. What makes that so? I know you said that, you know, people feel... It's a safe haven. Uh, yeah, safe, it's a safe haven for people in a time like this. But when you look at, for example, even the more, the more recent recession, 2008, mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. compare what real estate prices were then compared to what they were they are mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. There is a mm -hmm. dramatic difference in what those yes. prices are. So, so there was yes. a there was a plummeting in prices during that recession, but there's not in this one. So so the, the, the I'd say the real estate prices in jurisdictions such as Jamaica and other developing countries would have seen a less rapid increase during times of uncertainty when compared to 2008. Uh, the, 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 the strategy around that, or the reason for that, I should say, is we believe interest rates um, is a primary factor. So mm -hmm. going into the recession in 2007, there about interest rates were at a certain level. So persons who had, you know, monies to invest and to deploy were still able to get you know comfortable return on their investments. Now, with with interest rates being where they are now, you know there there isn't much need on or, or, or demand, I should say, for persons to sit and you know earn a one or two percent per annum when they can deploy this sort of capital in in stable um, assets. You're right. It's a completely different macroeconomic environment now Absolutely. than it was in 2008 Absolutely. so so back Absolutely. then there was way more uncertainty even without the pandemic mm -hmm. yes now we have been pre-covid we we're just on this this growth path and i think mm -hmm. for the real estate sector that just continued people say well, let's just just be there because covid is going to be over mm -hmm. at some point in time and we want to be in a position mm -hmm. to take advantage of that so so you're yeah. right Good points there so for those who have been hoping for a fall in prices so they can uh, have a, a good buying opportunity you don't see that coming ryan we're, we're not seeing that uh and you know when when you look at it i mean of all the industries i mean the PIOJ released a report recently and you know construction is up you know and in the middle of a recession that for us is very encouraging and the truth is the providers of credit are still very much active in the market mm. and and as, a, as as long as the providers of credit remain active the industry will be bound. Have you seen any, uh, or have you experienced any negative outfall, out, outcomings though? Because most companies have been affected. Your mm -hmm. earnings apparently have not <laughs> been affected, mm -hmm. at least from what we're seeing from the report. Yeah. But has there been any any spot where you have been? Yes, no, absolutely. I mean, no, no one is immune to COVID-19. We don't have a business vaccine for it. but. Uh, in, in Costa Rica, for sure, we had some impact there. Uh, our commercial tenants asked for some reprieve on on their on their rent, and you know we extended that um, throughout for a couple of months in 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 2020. Uh, but outside of that, no. And why I say this is that we again we had our pipeline prior to our IPO, so it's not as if we executed a lot of transactions in the middle of the pandemic. A lot of them would have occurred just before. And then Cayman is a the, the purchase that you have there is residential, but it residential, also, but it is also an economy that has a high dependence on tourism. So yes. did you see any fallout in Cayman, the Cayman properties? So our strategy in Cayman was not for short term rental, was more for for long term rental, residential rental. And remember, Cayman has a very active um, uh, financial services offshore right. financial services industry. And the truth is, Cayman has managed this pandemic, ex, you know, exceptionally well. Uh, I mean, persons, you know, largely don't even wear masks in, in Cayman. And because they've handled it so well, uh, what we're seeing is more or less like a remigration of, of citizens and persons who hold 
um, Caymanian passports back to Cayman. So it's a totally unique situation where Cayman is concerned. You know, late 2019, there was a lot of optimism about Guyana, given their recent oil find. There were projections for that economy to grow something like 300% in five years. And now mm -hmm. First Rock has some interest in Guyana. What are your plans there? Has anything been executed yet? Uh, we are, we're, we're literally on the brink, but um, I'm not at liberty to say specifically. Uh, but at this point, we, yes, we do. We have some real estate transactions that we're, we're pursuing there actively. And through our you know, associate entity, First Rock Global Holdings, we're moving into financial services there. Into financial servicing, so not, yes. services, not necessarily real estate in Guyana. Well, we're through a separate entity. So two different things. Yes, correct. So real okay. estate and financial services. How soon do you think it's it, we're going to start seeing some rebound, Ryan? So the optimism that I continue to have is predicated on the 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 the, the, the introduction of vaccines, right? Um, I know Jamaica is a little behind, but the territories that you know we are in, or the jurisdictions that we're in, you know, they have a very you know, aggressive and, you know, targeted, you know, vaccine penetration program. And, you know, we are of the view that late 2021, we should start seeing a turnaround, um, fingers crossed. Uh, in, I mean, internally, we, when doing our projections, you know, before we used to do like, you know, 12 month projections and, you know, we're doing our strategic retreats, it's like a 12 month, now we're down to six months, given Ooh. the, Given the, uh, given the uncertainties that um, that exist. And you also sit on the Economic Recovery Task Force, right? Uh, the, the Economic Council of the PSOJ. Ah, okay. Yes. Different, yes. Yeah, different things. Yes, yes. Yeah, so so you do have some insight there. Uh, have you broken ground yet on the, the luxury apartments that you're yes, we have. in Kingston? Yes, we have. We have all approvals and we have broken ground. Uh, we have you know, a campaign that you'll, you'll see very soon, but we are well advanced in our construction there. These are the luxury townhouses, right? Well, they're actually standalone homes. There are 12 homes on three and a half acres of land. Uh, each each home will have, you know, will be situated on a quarter acre lot, you know, own swimming pool, you know, 78,000 70, square feet of space, um, double master bedrooms up and upstairs and downstairs. I mean, it's really lovely. I, I mean, the professional team you know, has really done a good job. Vidal Dowding, you know, he really ex designed an excellent, um, excellent plan for for the development. Three and a half acres. You say, wow, this is yes. in Saint Andrew. Where exactly is this? Because that's a so, lot of space. So, I, thought, yes. I didn't even know Kingston had that kind of space. Yes. So this this property is on Bamboo Avenue, which is off Wellington Drive. Uh, it is literally across from the U.S. Embassy in that cul-de-sac road right there. Um, lovely, lovely street, and it it represented the largest single plot of, of land, of flat land, um, in Kingston Six. So it's it's truly an amazing property. Also, this was an this was actually an an empty lot because I know so, that what a lot of developers have been doing is buying yes. up properties that don't have like you might have a single house on a large piece of land and then yes. you know, demolishing the so house that, and the, their apartments. That, this was that was it. Spot. No, that was it. It was a small ho that's a small home on it. Uh, the, 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 the name of the entity or the name of the the, the occupant prior to was Dinner Estates. Uh, so it was one home on three and a half acres. I mean, it's so truly, truly, I love the property. Okay, I soon go drive by and fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sight to behold. <laughs> yeah, and and these start at I think you had told me last time hundred million. Is that still the price point? Well, the, the price point is is beyond that. Um, what we've done is that we reduced the density. Uh, so we at, at the time we had 16 units, we reduced to 12. Uh, so it's, really, it's, it's truly a an exclusive luxury community that we're that we're developing. We haven't Any finalized. No, we haven't started selling us yet. No, we have not. Um, deliberately so. Okay, and you you're about to say you haven't finalized something. On the price. On the price. Okay, well, yeah, so you can't sell until you finalize on the price. That's important, huh? Yes, finalizing the price is important. Uh, I, what, what we're doing is that we're getting a lot of interest, so we're allowing the interest to, to determine, really, um, the final price that we end up at. 
Mm. Are there other markets that you want to explore? Well, at this time, Guyana, um, that we are exploring, but beyond that, uh, there, there no other, there's no other jurisdiction that we're eyeing. I think you have a, a new uh, CEO in Barbados, right? Yes. Yes, so First Talk Global Holdings is an associate company. Well, not associate company, but a member of the First Talk Group. Uh, it's a privately held firm, and the managing director for that entity is Christopher Young. Um, Christopher Young is in you know, a seasoned financial services professional with a lot of experience in investments and private equity. So he's pursuing opportunities within the financial services, financial services and SME space. Mm, okay. Well, thank you so much, Ryan, for giving us updates on, on where First Rock is. Where do you see this company in five years? So the, 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 the primary target for us is really, you know, increasing shareholder value. And the best way to do that is to, in our mind, just do the growth in our balance sheet. So we focus squarely on asset growth and capital growth. And, you know, I think what we've done over the last two years has been phenomenal. It absolutely has been. In a very short period of time, you have you. made your mark. People are taking notes and you're on the verge of very big things. I wish you Thank all you the so best and great success. An excellent, excellent show, Kalila, and all the best of yours. All right, good. Take Bye, care. Ryan. Bye. Up next, we've got your market recap, and the analysts are standing by. This segment of Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency, Insurance Made Easy, and Massey United Insurance. How good is your insurance? Time now for your market recap, brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. The Jamaica Stock Exchange advanced, with the combined index gaining almost 1%. 102 stocks traded across both the main and the junior markets of the JSC for the week ending Friday, February 26, 2020. 50 advanced, 44 declined, and 8 stayed the same. Nearly 174 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling $722 million. Wigton Wind Farm ordinary shares traded the most, taking up 17% of market volume. The stock lost 4 cents to open the week at 70 cents. Pulse Investments traded the second highest, with people buying and selling 20 million shares in the company. The stock lost 7 cents to open the week at $4.67. And Trans Jamaican Highway rounded out the most traded, taking up nearly 10% of market volume. The stock lost 2 cents to close last week at $1.33. Now let's see who had the biggest gains. I Create Ordinary Shares jumped 55% and took the top spot for the biggest gains last week. And the I Create stock did not stop there. The stock also came in second for the biggest gains for the month of February to close last week at 93 cents. Sibony Group stock just keeps rising. The stock came in second for last week's biggest gains, with its stock rising nearly 34%. And no surprise here, but with consistent gains, the stock was the top performer for the month of February. The stock started this new month, March, at $1.66. And rounding off the biggest gains, Caribbean Producers Jamaica stock advanced nearly 29% to open this week at $3.44. On the losing side now, Key Insurance Company fell nearly 24% last week. The stock was also the worst performing for the month of February. The stock opened this new month March at $4.21. 138 Student Living Jamaica fell nearly 19% last week. However, the stock was third on our biggest gains list to end the month of February at $5.71 a share. Rounding off the biggest losers, though, was Palace Amusement Company, which lost nearly 15%. Its stock also took a major hit as February's second worst performing. The stock opened this new month March at $800.98. Now here's a quick look at some other highlights of the month of February. The main index advanced by less than 2%. The junior market advanced by 5%, and the financial gained 1%. 138 Student Living Jamaica Variable Preference was the third biggest loser for the month of February. Its stock price went down nearly 23% to close February at $5.10. Market Recap was brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments.
This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, is brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers and Proven Wealth. Welcome back to Taking Stock. I've got a team of analysts to examine the week in business. I'm joined by Group Sovereign Research Analyst at JMMB, Theodore Mitchell, and business writer at The Observer, David Rose. Hi, David. It looks like it's only you and me today. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll be joined by Theo from JMMB, but if not, we shall carry the fort, right? Yes, we shall. It's in the month. Got to keep business going. Absolutely. So, the big standout this month has been Sibony Group, and it's a, a curious situation because the stock price is up by, how much is it? It's like a thousand percent? It's a whole heap. It's well, up by a lot. It's in there at 22 cents, went as high as $2.20 yesterday. So, <laughs> And I saw, 100%. in doing my research for this segment, I saw an article in the Gleaner from August of 2020, and the stock price then was 11 cents. So imagine in less than a year, it has gone from 11 cents to now $2 and change. And Sibony is a very curious case because they're basically at this point just a shell company. They're owned by FinSAC. So what's going on with Sibony, David? What are your sources telling you that's driving up the stock price? Well, let's get some background on Sibony. So for those who don't know, in the 1990s, Jamaica went through what they call a worse economic meltdown. And during that time, you had this company at the government created called FinSAC, which acquired several companies, acquired several large financial companies, and from failing. So what you end up happening was that Sibony had some debts that, in essence, went bad. And because of that, FinSAC took over, and the company that used to operate in several hotels had to dispose of its assets. And time has continued going on and on where the directors of Sibony, which are basically FinTech, keep exposing the assets. And what ended up happening was that at the end of 2018, they finally sold their last piece of asset, which was a, a beach in, Mont in Westmoreland, more than $200 million. They paid a 34-cent dividend. So imagine, they paid a dividend that was higher than the stock price. So it's a question for around like 12 cents, and the dividend was 34 cents. And then... It picked up, came back down, and that's just it. But since then, Sibony has been losing money each year because I guess it's a shell company. So Sibony only has cash and tax receivable, tax receivable right now. So the things that directors have tried saying that, you know, we're hoping that to sell this company to somebody else because the proposition that Sibony is placing towards a person that wants to, you know, listen to JSC is that by Sibony, do a reverse takeover and listen to JSC was having to go through several processes because if you're into this tier company, you have to go to the FSC, the JSC company's office, uh, several fees to incur. So if you're to take FinTech stake and reverse take on the JSC, that's probably not clear direct opportunity to this tier company, but it's time to actually you know go through all those steps. So you, you've seen in the last couple of weeks that persons have you know, just been buying up on Sibony, but it's kind of price went up, 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 up. And you have to see more money coming in as well as continue to increase. So right now, the main thing that would have driven up Sibony's price is potential speculation generally, along with the idea that Finsec has found a buyer. Because if Finsec has found a buyer who actually can turn their businesses onto the market and drive significant value, then you're getting this company for a steal. But there's been no confirmed announcement. One thing that has come out of Sibony is that they've confirmed their AGM and a general meeting for March 16, which is going to be a very fun day because they got pressure permission from the Supreme Court to hold their AGM virtually. So persons from all over can actually actually see this AGM now and find out did they find the bio. But it's the first agent they had in three years, 2018. So hold the asset, last AGM was then, all of a sudden they're having their AGM again and price had to spike now. So, and it, it fell back down today, it was to turn dollar fifty. The peak has come, the peak has been hit from yesterday and has come back down, but we're still seeing that persons are just, you know, speculating on the stock. Right, including some who just buying into the hype. Uh, this is the price going up and they feel like, okay, what, something must be going on. Let me jump on this. But I'm hearing similar uh, whisperings as you are, David, that there may be some some buyer that has been found by FinSAC. So the article that I referenced from the Gleena last year was that FinSAC had was looking for a buyer as well. Let me bring it up right now. So they were trying to sell their stake in the company again, but that attempt was aborted. 
And so what we're hearing on the streets now is that there may be some potential interest to do exactly what you said, that you know, a, a company that is already profitable. And so now we're hearing the same thing, or I'm hearing the same thing that you've been hearing, David, uh, those whisperings that perhaps there is a buyer for this company now. And what they want to do is, so it's a profitable company, and I'm hearing a particular name, but there's been no confirmation of this just yet, so I'm not gonna put that out there. But what the rumors are is that there is a profitable company, a very profitable company, that wants to, to buy, I suppose, the shell or the name of Siboney and be able to take advantage of being listed on the stock exchange without having to go through that extensive process of listing themselves. And so some people may have gotten word of that and that would be what is driving up the stock price. But like you said, there has been no confirmation of any of these things right now, at least on my part, it's all speculation and rumors. So. Um, I don't know what insiders, and I did an episode of Money Mondays JA recently on insider trading, but I don't know what insiders have been hearing and what moves they've been making based on inside knowledge. But this is, you know, these are the rumors that are out there that has caused the stock price to jump that significantly in such a short time. If you had anything else to add on Sibony David before we moved on to Mailpack? Well, Sibony is just, you know as is and another company that technically is a Sibony right now is SLVC which is SLVG Capital so it's a similar story and how we're actually understanding what's going to happen potentially with Sibony so you had CTW Music it's in 2013 or 2012 and the company was basically unprofitable and was heading for failure so SSL Second Credit Limited the actual brokerage firm stepped in and said hey we will actually drivers take over, take control of the company, and we will, you know, have greater bench capital firms actually be that new company that's still is in the junior market. And their attempt was to, you know, inject money into these uh, bench capital, co into these small companies that are growing further and growing, and, you know, eventually list them on the JSC. However, those prospects have basically vanished into thin air because uh, Blue Dot, which is run by Lauren Peart, he bought back his taking his company last April. Uh, uh, for Bar Central Limited, they are SLVC basically wind the company up after Frith and the founders, or in those cases, principal, just left the company to into real estate. And then Muse360, which has basically been mothballed since the late Andre Burton left the company in 2019. So you're seeing a similar situation with SLVC, which gives you an insight as to how this process works. So SLVC is technically like a Sibony right now because. News 360 is basically been operating since uh, uh, 2019. Barrison has been wound up and you, uh, I was sold off. So the company just cash and liabilities made it sell the company. So that's a best example of persons who want to go and look and see how every sticker potentially works and what might happen with Sibani if that buyer does materialize. Because the material, buyer doesn't materialize, then the surprise kind of needs to go back to the, the sense range because no sense went anymore right so there is precedent for something like this and i'm glad that you raised the example of sslvc and uh, and uh, c2w music so this is basically how it works if indeed it does materialize then some people would stand to make quite a substantial profit let's move on to one of my favorite listed companies mailpack so mailpack has released their results for last year for 2020 and they are showing, and they are showing really, really significant uh, returns. They are, they have even exceeded the projections from their IPO prospectus, David. So, what are the highlights coming out of Mailpack? So, Mailpack had what anyone would call a story, a fairy tale story, or just a grand year, because you, Mailpack was projecting X, and COVID happened, and Mailpack got pushed like probably five years into the future. Because anyway, you spun it, you could not do the old ways of doing things last year. Even going this year, you still can't do way of doing things. So Mailpack, you know, for those who don't know, operates mainly, you know, it's a logistics company in a sense, whereby you order your goods in the U.S., probably from Amazon, send it to their address, ta tax-free address in Miami, and then bring it to Jamaica, and you pay a fee. And that's just the international business. They also have the local business, which, you know, deliver some price from Price Mart from high low and a few other city locations. And the company basically, you know, said, 
COVID was basically a great to accelerator for them because all of a sudden, persons basically said, wait, I can't go out. There's probably a curfew, scared of COVID, and I still have to live. So persons actually had to go on in and be like, how can I get things to myself? And I'm like, wait, here's my pack. And remember, you have to be getting things for your new online life, a laptop, some electric device. So you found persons were basically forced to adapt to new environment. And my pack was this perfect position as a company, which got their IPO have this tax break and just, you know, had that presence. So their top line revenue for the fourth quarter, which is the busiest season of the year, which is Christmas, was up by 41% over the prior period. So they did $510 million, $512 million in revenue, coming to like $361 million in the prior financial year. And the thing is, mail pack cost of sales went up significantly just because they had to charter a plane and take several of the extraordinary expenses just to ensure that clients got their goods which said that this is a lot because imagine you had been already expanding your footprint or aerospace accommodate this increased demand and even then you still had to you know take extraordinary measures just to ensure your clients right the spider got their goods on time so this is going to be a very good year because even though Melpac's revenue actually profits fell below an anticipation of most persons in the market and came out to 101 million dollars that's still 20 percent higher than the prior financial prior quarter and you know persons were saying you know oh i was supposed to back to go 150 million dollars and up in terms of profit in fact still gave a six cent dividend which is 150 million dollars to shareholders which is payable next month and so, they also noted david that so they had to charter that plane because of the of those planes because of the extraordinary circumstance they wouldn't have plans for COVID-19, obviously, and the sudden surge in demand, but it's put them in a better position now to be able to go ahead in 2021, 2022. They now have an idea of what the expectation will be, and they have made those arrangements permanent, so they wouldn't have that extraordinary expense anymore. Let me welcome Theodore. Theodore is finally able to join us here on this last part. We're close to wrapping, Theo. But I want to hear you because we went over, David and I went over the Sibony uh, situation earlier in the program. And I want to know if there are any insights you're able to offer us on the Sibony Group, Theo. Maybe you know, Sibony is a Jamaica game, game shop. Um, GameStop. GameStop. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not seeing anything which would warrant uh, an increase in the value of Sibony. There is not, I mean, the, the company doesn't have any assets on it. But, um, you know, at best, you would have thought that it is a reversed um, takeover in terms of an entity, just as a, I, I don't recall which company, but there was one entity where it is, uh, I think it was music, where um, one company actually took over that particular entity because there is a cost associated with uh, doing an IPO. So it is that there's an entity on the stock market um, that another company could actually purchase it and utilize it to do business, then you know, they will so do. But from Sibonis' perspective, um, you know, to see that jump in terms of pricing for a company that does not have an asset on its book, you know, it is that it is carrying out an operational activity, which is, uh, you know, could say, well, it has value in it. I think it's nonsensical and it's perhaps just individuals chasing. Um, Let's take a look at the macroeconomic front for a little bit before we wrap, Thea. I see the PIOJ has put out their projections that there is going to be a return to growth within the next quarter. Do you share that optimism? Potentially it could happen, but I'm not as optimistic as the Planning Institute. Notably, just looking at um, the data from Statin, which um, notably the data from Statin um, you know, uh, comes, is the official data. Uh, we saw where it is that in Q1, the economy, Q1 2020, the economy contracted by 3.4%. Uh, during Q1, uh, we didn't have any significant impact from COVID. It was actually Q2 that we saw where it is that there was a major impact from COVID. So I think it is that um, given what we're seeing now in terms of continued lockdown, uh, the lockdown, additional lockdown measures being instituted, uh, that what is happening in North America and Canada as it relates to tourism and our own action as it relates to restriction of travel from um, the UK, 
that will have a negative effect on the tourism industry. So as I noted, you didn't saw a significant reduction in Q1 um, for tourism. It was it was down 14.1 percent compared to Q2 of 8.5 percent. So um, you know, with what is happening, I expect tourism to go down. Uh, rather, the, 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 uh, I'm not anticipating any, any significant growth. In fact, I expect decline there. Uh, where it is that you will see a bit of a growth is in terms of bauxite, but that um, constitutes only two point. Percent of the overall uh, GDP. There's expectation of growth in construction, but there are some challenges with the industry as we speak, notably logistic issue. The price of steel have, has gone up, likewise, the price of lumber. Yes, construction grew by 6% in the fourth quarter of, 20, uh, of 2020. But with what is happening or what is developing in the industry at this particular point in time, it could redound negatively on um, the growth prospect, notwithstanding the government spending on the um, South Coast Highway. So, um, you know, there's, it, there's, a, there, there's negative, uh, uh, there's headwinds um, in that particular industry. On the manufacturing side, uh, with what is happening as it relates to unemployment, etc., I don't foresee any significant shift in terms of the growth momentum there. So um, Q1, I do not foresee an improvement Movement in Q1, uh, you know, where it is that is possible is, um, you know, Q2, Q3. That's where it is that the economy contracted significantly in 2020. Good. So that's when I expect, um, you know, to see an optic in terms of growth to the economy. All right. Thank you very much, Theo. David, all the best. Uh, thanks, Galila. Thanks much, Galila. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers and Proven Wealth. That's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to this channel, and share with a friend. Also, subscribe to our newsletter at kalilareynolds.com and turn on those post notifications so that you can be the first to see all my other features. We want to help people learn more about money so we can all get this money together. This week on Money Mondays JA, I'm telling you seven ways to make money from the comfort of your home. And on Money Moves JA, we're looking at pension options for small businesses. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Kalila Ray and follow at Taking Stock JA on Instagram. If you want to connect with the analysts this week, check the description box below for their contact information. Also visit our website, kalilareynolds.com for financial information you can use however you like it. Watch, listen, or read. Now tell a friend about taking stock. Investing is the new sexy, so let's make it cool to talk about money. I'm Kalila Reynolds. Let's get this money. Let's get this money. <laughs> Hehehehehe <laughs>